Let's get more on this. And we're talking with Sun Yun Lee, Professor in Korean Studies and Assistant Professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Professor, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Let's, Thank you. let's start with comments by uh, the United States Vice President, Mike Pence, who says the reason that the leaders of the United States and North Korea are coming together is because of the tough sanctions imposed by the United States. Is that correct, do you think? It's partly relevant, surely. It is inconceivable that Kim Jong-un woke up on New Year's Day and had a moment of epiphany and said, hey, I'm going to be a nice guy going forward. It's highly unlikely that Kim Jong-un was so moved by the South Korean president's outreach and his patience during that banner ballistic year, continual provocations that North Korea put on last year. The more pertinent factors are North Korea is now feeling the pinch, but not to the extent of destabilizing the regime. We're still long ways off from that kind of concerted sanctions enforcement. But the real reason, in my view, is this was all premeditated. It's not unexpected. It's not unprincipled. Un unpredictable and certainly it's not unprecedented. Kim Jong-un is taking a page out of his daddy's playbook, Kim Jong-il, who in 2000 put on the first ever inter-Korean summit with the South Korean president in June and also pocketed $500 million in doing so, charging the South Korean visitor an exorbitant admission fee and then turned his gaze on the United States. In October, Kim Jong-il sent a special envoy, and that was unprecedented. Uh, for the first time ever, North Korea sent a special envoy to Washington who carried the message of invitation to President Clinton to visit his boss in Pyongyang. And Clinton was very keen on making it happen. The only reason Clinton's visit did not take place was because of the uncertainty following the presidential election, the Al Gore, George W. Bush vote recount problem, and time simply ran out. But just three weeks after receiving the North Korean special envoy, Clinton sent his own Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, to Pyongyang just three weeks later. And there you had it, Madeleine Albright in late October, toasting Kim Jong-il, sitting with Kim Jong-il side by side, watching the mass game, so-called the world's most spectacular show, a manifestation of totalitarianism. So all this is not really unprecedented. What is different today from the past are that North Korea stands on the verge of nuclear breakout. It showed the world that it can hit every corner of U.S. mainland. And also that North Korea has an unprecedented secret bias-busting, bunker-busting weapon in the first sister. Don't be surprised if the first sister, Kim Yo-jong, makes a trans-Pacific trip to Washington to further soften up President Trump and persuade him to come to Pyongyang later on this year. Yeah, you say soften him up. Just how wary should President Trump be when he enters these, uh, these planned talks? Because I notice you, you have written that denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and a moratorium on uh, nuclear and missile tests, Kim seeks to weaken sanctions and preempt US military preemption. While the world remains astonished by this sudden outreach, when you look at the terms, the message conveyed via the South Korean envoys to Washington, there has been no concession whatsoever. Kim basically said that he would be amenable to talking about denuclearization, which North Korea has off and on over the past 25 years, and that Kim for the time being, will refrain from conducting nuclear and ballistic missile tests. Now, all those activities are prohibited by more than 10 UN Security Council resolutions. So the mere utterance of abstaining from illicit activities is no concession at all. But North Korea has been able to condition the world into lowering the bar and growing excited with unrealistic expectations whenever North Korea comes down a rung or two down the ladder of escalation. Should we take uh, Kim at his word, though, when he says that uh, he would suspend all nuclear and ballistic missile tests while these talks are being planned and then underway? There is always a time for a first. One cannot rule that out. But history suggests otherwise. It was just 
in 2012, when Kim was in power, his first year in power, that North Korea and the U.S. came to an agreement on February 29th, on Leap Day in 2012. The terms were basically North Korea would freeze, put on a moratorium, suspend nuclear and missile tests, in return would receive from the U.S. 240,000 tons of nutritional assistance, as it was said. Now, what happened? Just 16 days later, North Korea announced to the world that it would launch a satellite into space in violation of that agreement because satellite launch requires ballistic missile technology. Americans were dumbfounded by that, but it goes to show that Americans underestimate North Korea. They lie at will. Strategic deception is very patriotic. It's a crucial means of regime preservation. They were testing the waters. They were testing the U.S. to see how far the U.S. would go in making concessions. So there is the possibility Kim is doing that again this time around, and the summit may never take place. But I think the situation this time is a bit different. Kim does feel some pinch from sanctions enforcement and is keen on buying more time and money with which to perfect his own nuclear posture review. They have a strategy. We have to recognize that. Yeah, I mean, you do sound very skeptical, though, and in particular as far as uh, Kim's commitment perhaps to dismantling uh, the country's nuclear arsenal. Well, forgive me if I come across as boorish and skeptical, but the record over the past 25 years on nuclear diplomacy alone, what has the U.S. and its supporters, what has the other side gained? Nothing. All in return for North Korea's repeated lies of denuclearization, by my conservative estimation, the U.S. and South Korea and China and Japan have given North Korea well over $20 billion in aid. The United States alone, during the Clinton and Bush administrations, gave North Korea over $1.3 billion of food and fuel assistance. For what? For North Korea's denuclearization, so-called. So we have to understand that North Korea is good at playing both the carrot and stick, propaganda and provocations, and probably North Korea sees the acquisition of a credible nuclear arsenal with which it can threaten the United States as the key step in removing U.S. troops from the South and prevailing over that other Korean state, one that just happens to be a magnet to North Korea's own people, a legitimate, a prosperous, free country. And, and just briefly, what of South Korea's role in these latest developments, in particular the leader Moon Jae-in? Uh, do you think perhaps he's been a little naive? Well, it's good politics to create the atmospherics of peace and reconciliation because that calms nerves whenever there is escalation and threat of war, rhetoric of war and total destruction. The public grows nervous. It may drive even foreign investors away. So it's good business. It's good politics. And in the short term, it's the pragmatic choice, I suppose. But the North Korean lethal threat to the United States and most notably to South Korea itself, only continues to grow. So South Korea should shape up and stop making these concessions that South Korea already has in defiance of UN Security Council resolutions, South Korea's own sanctions against North Korea and American sanctions against North Korea, really bending over backward to accommodate Kim Yo-jong, the sister, and her colleagues, many who are designated by the UN Security Council and South Korea and the United States. Professor Song Yun Lee, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.